Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, as always. Excited to be joined by a fellow learning science advocate. I'd like to welcome Michael Toth to Trending in Education. Michael is the founder and CEO of a company called Learning Sciences International, also known as LSI. We're going to have what I hope is a really interesting conversation about learning science and team-based learning and lots of interesting things on Michael's radar. But before we do any of that, Michael, I just wanted to welcome you to Trending in Education. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate being here. Yeah, yeah. It's great to have you. And you've been leading a company for some time in the space of applying learning science research and establishing a consultancy. And then you've been doing that through challenging times over the last couple of years. And you've also been doing applied research in this challenging period that we're living in. Hopefully we can get into all of that, get some of your perspective on where the world of learning is heading along the way. To begin, I always like to ask my guests for their origin story. How did you get to this point in your hero's quest? I know that could be a full episode, but we're going to try to do it relatively short. Can you catch us up on how you got to this point in your career? Sure. I was a faculty grant director in a teacher education college in a public university for about eight years. And I spun my research and development team out to found Learning Sciences International or LSI. And we have, our social mission is very poignant. Everything we do is around our social mission, and that is to end generational poverty Mm -hmm. and to eliminate racial achievement gaps. And that's very personal to me, just because of my background growing up in poverty. And unlike most of my uh, research colleagues, I did not have a good experience in school. I hated school. Mm -hmm. I would have dropped out. But it felt like a prison to me and the teachers felt like in wardens in, in that prison and the, just the effects of poverty, they just never leave you, even though it's, I'm an outlier, I've escaped out of it. It's just very challenging to get upward mobility coming out because you just don't have the systems that advantaged children have. And I think schools have the promise to be the great equalizer, but we're not living up to that promise right now. Yeah. And that's what we've dedicated our life to studying and changing. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of your story, you founded your consultancy to help schools and educators. Who do you work with typically? We work whole district reforms. So in that case, we'll work with the superintendent and cabinet. And we also work at this individual school level. Mm-hmm. We divide our practice, our, our consultancy into four practice areas or areas of expertise. Uh-huh. We have the best school turnaround track record for per- persistently low performing schools in the United States. All of our schools went up during the pandemic, which is <laughs> remarkable. We do evaluation services, which is really around professional growth and development for teachers and leaders. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of our areas are really around our uh, solutions and we target title one schools in particular because that that's what our social mission is about but that is getting uh, well-defined instructional leadership with the right competencies for the 21st century breaking of these generational poverty which is very different than what most people think they are and we're teaching and learning and core instruction to be able to equip students to be able to break free of poverty. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like you have some strong opinions as well on whether there is a technology silver bullet and whether there's going to be a killer app that's going to transform education and the future of K-12 schooling or whether there are going to be other drivers of that transformation. I know you also do a lot of research as part of your organization. Can you dig into a little bit of that for us? Um, If anything we've learned through the pandemic is that likely there isn't going to be a technological silver bullet. Silicon Valley is putting a whole lot of money into this. I think Gates Foundation some time ago kicked that process off. Can technology be that solution? And here's what we found, and, and I authored a book not that long ago called The Power of Student Teams with my co-author, uh, David Sousa, the famed neuro 
science expert in research clearly tells us is when students become the bicentric, and we see this in advantage as well as disadvantage students, they lose empathy and the brain actually wires differently. And it can see this in brain scans. And that's a concern because of the number of hours kids are spending on devices. We believe by far, and I think the research is very clear on this, the most effective education is that with a high quality teacher in front of an effective teacher in front of his or her students and with strong core instruction. Now that can be augmented with technology. Mm -hmm. We also have a whole division of computer programmers. We also do software. Yeah. All of our software is supporting core instruction, not replacing it. Yeah. And that's the key piece for me. Students need to learn in front of human beings. They need to interact with each other and technology can absolutely be used as a area for them to extend their research, to bring in outside expertise and to enrich the educational process. But it still comes down to a teacher and a student learning effectively in a learning partnership. Yeah. And the environment in which they learn is the thing that's been so profoundly disrupted by the pandemic that it's been an accelerant in a lot of places where things like simulations and virtual reality and ways in which you can experience something close to being in physical proximity to someone else through technology. When you're saying a teacher in proximity with her class, best case, you're saying that would be a physical in-person experience. That's correct. Yeah. And let it, virtual reality will keep getting better. That's the whole metaverse process that's going on, mm -hmm. but that's not going to substitute for the social emotional learning skills that you develop when you're with a human being, mm -hmm. how you interact, how you talk. We're seeing because of the vast amount of texting, kids will literally text each other when they're in the same room that we've absolutely noticed an erosion of these skills of yeah. making eye contact, having confidence to have a conversation, particularly a conversation with an adult. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're working in a classroom, we're attempting to transform that classroom from uh, teacher centered instruction, which is 99% of what we, we see in core instruction, some form of that. Yeah a varying degrees of effectiveness into uh, team-based learning, which is our particular emphasis is student-directed or student-led team learning, mm -hmm. where the, the students get more and more responsibility in their learning, they accept more ownership, they're able to handle more rigorous tasks because they're working collaboratively on those tasks with real roles, defined roles, defined protocols. And what we see is it develops two things, not only develops rigor of the learning, it accelerates the academics. We did a What work Works Clearinghouse, that's the federal standard for education research study with 10,000 students and showed that this closed gaps for every subgroup, black male to white male, ELL students to English proficient, uh, all the group, including students with disabilities, all of them benefited from more rigorous, more collaborative. But what we found is the teachers really aren't trained to be able to do that. In fact, they're trained the opposite. They're trained mm -hmm. in what we would call the legacy instructional model of the teacher predominantly lectures and the students predominantly listen or do independent practice. And there's no robust peer conversation or debate. And what mm -hmm. we found is that when you look at that by economics, that it worsens meaning it gets much more teacher centered, much less interactive, the more students are coming uh, from poverty as well as black and brown students. And we think this is heavily contributing to the issue that when they went to virtual learning, the students that have more agency developed from home or because their parents just managed it did okay through the pandemic. I think that the results are showing that, but students that didn't have that are where their parents were working and, or not able for whatever reason or their guardians, we found precipitous declines. And so what we have found is the difference between the haves and have nots has only worsened. Yeah. It hasn't gotten better. Mm -hmm. 
This is our economy in general, which we think is in part due to this broader issue of the haves and have nots have two education systems in this country. Yeah, that's interesting. And at the same time, while the educational system that children of poverty are in is more likely that top-down instructional, I've heard it referred to as a cells and bells approach to the design of the school system. Those are also the kids who need to rely more on the, the safety net that these schools can provide as well. They're getting their lunch, their, their food security is coming from the fact that they can go there. It's just a safer place in, in some cases than what they would have otherwise. And then you add on top of that, the threats, the public health threats of the, the pandemic, which also impact black and brown populations and low socioeconomic parts of the country and the world more perniciously. It's, it's a place where things can get disheartening. Couple quick notes. One is I really like the point about the screens as the driver of the challenge, like screen addiction and the impact of social apps emerging on those screens that are addictive and social and lead to like negative outcomes for teens. That's something we saw pre pandemic mm. and the pandemic likely has been accelerating that trend to the point where there's more of a threat there. So, but then secondly, maybe this is where some of the hope is the collaborative work which is also a lot of what you hear about in successful organizations is likely the type of work that humans are going to be asked to do more of as the workplace continues to get transformed uh, by artificial intelligence and other drivers. The other issue that comes up frequently is how much our educational programs helping our children become good employees, among other things, in the future? And is there a misalignment there? I'd love to get some of your perspective on where the future workplace is heading and how our K-12 systems can and should design themselves to be more aligned there. I wrote a, uh, a little book called Who Moved My Standards, which really was explaining these shifts as the, the now not so new, but still relatively no more rigorous standards, uh, wave of reform came in and it, it really hits on this issue when we like to call them new economy skills, the currency of the new economy is creation, collaboration, teamwork. If you can't create and innovate, you're really in, in danger of technology eroding your economic status. Probably the most apparent one is going into a McDonald's and seeing even food service. Traditionally safe, lower wage job is getting um, disrupted now with kiosk and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is only going to continue and we have to create independent thinking, collaborative students and not dependent and compliant students. Mm -hmm. Some schools are progressing more than others on this and in all schools, in all circumstances, I just want to be really clear. We have hardworking teachers and principals, if anything, in my opinion, working too hard. Mm -hmm or not enough result. And I believe what we're working on is just the wrong core instruction model. In my research, there's actually three tier one or core instructions. There's the traditional one that we know, which is heavily teacher centered. And then we have one that's a little looser, which is in our minds, teacher directed group learning. And then the highest version, which is when the students really take control of their own collaborative learning processes and really partner with the teacher. Now, where we have some dissidence is that students that come to school with not well-developed agency, now all students have the capacity to have well-developed agency, and that doesn't matter of background, it doesn't matter of race, doesn't matter of culture. What matters is where they had an opportunity to develop it. And whenever we have schools that have high control and they have high control, because if they don't, they'll have discipline issues and, and dysfunction. And because of our turnaround work, we work in those schools. We clean that up very quickly through the normal processes. But then what we do immediately, as soon as you gain control and have the adults in control, you pivot to teaching agency. And what I mean by agency is the ability to self-regulate, the ability to have collaborative processes, norms of conduct so that students can do collaborative work. And as soon as we do that, 
even students that had no background in this, the first thing we hear from teachers, they'll say to us, I didn't know my kids could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's very legitimate because the students hadn't had an opportunity. And so teachers know inherently, if we just back off and give some autonomy to kids, particularly those that, that haven't been taught yet and haven't developed those skills, we'll just lose control. Mm -hmm. So there's this constant little tension of the teacher staying in control. Whereas once you teach students how to self-regulate and peer regulate, this wonderful thing happens where you can spend your time on teaching and learning and do more release to your students. In this case, releasing more rigorous tasks to them. Mm -hmm. And they develop new economy skills. And this is what we see is the key of breaking generational poverty is moving from dependent and compliant learners mm. to independent critical thinkers that are able to share leadership. They develop leadership skills, they are able to problem solve together and do this with relative autonomy from the teacher, though the teacher is still, of course, the uh, learning expert in the room. Yeah, that's really interesting. It reminds me of some of the research I've seen around psychological safety and culture mm -hmm. building in a corporate setting where ultimately you want your employees to feel empowered enough to challenge the status quo. And I could see how the importance of actually having control of the space where there are schools where it becomes a more of a safety issue until you have the, the, the basics of a safe environment that you can provide. But once you have that to then pivot is a way of signaling that the reason those who are in authority are establishing safety is ultimately in service of a better dynamic. And I think lots of times we get stuck in that control dynamic. And I imagine that's particularly true in Title I schools and in schools that really need the turnaround that you're talking about. You're striking me as somewhat hopeful, though, too. It sounds as though there's, there's meaningful learnings that you found. There are real challenges that are educators, uh, particularly in the front lines of the pandemic, and in some ways not feeling that sense of agency themselves, frankly, that you're describing. Sure. But, uh, but it sounds like there are some rays of hope. One of, one of the trends that we're tracking is vulnerable virtues. So this is where we're trying to honestly be optimistic, which I do think is a virtue in these challenging times. There are there places where you're hopeful. And then at the same time, we all need to be realistic about some of the, the systemic challenges and some of the genuine real threats that folks are up against these days. How, how would you characterize the current state of play in K-12? Uh, we're very optimistic and we always start these conversations with grace. Teachers are working as hard as they can. Principals are working hard as they can. We can't ask more. And when you look at most of these reforms, they're trying to ask more from the same people that have no, there's no more well to give from. Yeah. And if anything, the pandemic has exhausted what little resilience was still there. We're trying to come out with a very different message. And that is, um, we want your kids to work harder, not you. Mm -hmm. We want to give you the skills so that you can develop your students into better students and therefore better learners. And therefore your job actually gets tremendously easier. And that has happened in the thousands of classrooms that we've taken people through this mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. In fact, in some cases, the teacher come up to us and say to our coaches, what do I do? They're learning without, can we say this is a wonderful thing. This isn't a reform that's going to come, unfortunately, from pre-service, um, teacher education, because it's unfortunately stuck in the past. And that's because the, the professors and, and they're very good people are looking at traditional research which studies how to get a better teacher centered teacher, mm -hmm. not a, this new collaborative way with student led learning processes. They just didn't experience it. Yeah. And it's not well studied even today. We're one of the leaders in studying that. And we keep trying to take a old kind of worn out model that's been there for centuries and try to tweak it better. And it's not going to happen with 21st century learners. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be more engaged by listening to an adult talk to them. Their, their brains have already wired differently with the technology. The engagement they can get after school is so much higher than what they can get in school. Yeah. And kids 
say they power down to come into school. The way to make it engaging isn't to have the teacher more engaging. Not at all. It's to give really engaging learning tasks to kids and let them work collaboratively to solve it and use technology as the tool it was meant, which is to help them create and innovate and research mm. instead of tethering them to a computer that's spitting out test questions and then serving them mundane computer directed instruction, which is nothing much different than the human delivered direct instruction. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I got a few directions I want to go coming out of that. The first of which is one of my new uh, quotes that I like these days, a little provocative. It's busy as the new stupid. <laughs> Which is even in management, I would joke about this, although arguably this is why I'm outside of management these days, is that if you're good at managing, good at delegating, you're frequently letting go of work that you could do yourself. And there's a real risk there. It's almost like when you're swinging from vine to vine, this is where you have to let go of something. And there's a little bit of a leap of faith to get to that, that next place. And then at the same time, there's a lot of measurement and you were talking a little bit about the, the testing that happens in our schools and what are those kinds of tests designed for frequently our educators are not comfortable letting go when they're also concerned that things that they're measured against are very much tied to more of what traditionally would be a top down, I'm going to teach you how to perform well on this test. Can you respond to that? Yeah, it's, and it's counterintuitive, but here's what we'll go through. Teachers covering a quantity of learning at a surface level, which is all you can lecture at, by the way, because students have to do the work to apply the work to their mental models, challenging their mental models. They have to have processing time with their peers to be able to do that. They have to well construct a task. So if we're just spoon feeding that lecturing, giving them worksheets, checking the worksheets and moving on, they will not test well. And the reason they will not test well, that's the definition of weak core instruction. Very little student ownership, very little student interaction, very low rigor. And what you will find is then they want to do test prep to try to fix that. Mm. It just has the kids check out even more. Mm -hmm. When you really analyze the, the items, the, the items in high stakes tests, state tests, as an example, are not covering all the standards. They're only covering the priority standards. And you can look at that in your test specs. These are available in all 50 states. And the curriculum office has responsibility to map to priority standards, which allows for deeper learning. What we found is by slowing down, focusing on the priority standards, giving kids time for deeper learning, they do better because when they're in front of a test bank, they have to be able to think their way through those questions. As long as we spoon feed them, give them low rigor and on taxonomy level, we're talking like retrieval. I give it to you, you spit it back to me. Mm -hmm. That's what we find the majority of instruction at particularly for black and brown students and students from poverty of all races. Mm -hmm. Rigor lowers, it does not increase for these kids. Yeah. And there's abundant research on this. And, and the reason is that many times well-intentioned teachers don't feel they're quote ready for rigor. And here's what we know about the human brain. There is no such thing as ready for rigor. You get ready by doing right. Mm -hmm. That's what fires off the brain cells to develop. This is. Children have this amazing neuroplasticity. Like they just develop at many times of an adult brain. We just need to harness that, let them be involved in our learning process. And then the teacher has to build the processes and basically give strategies to students to be able to handle that learning. We can't assume that they just have it. We have to build that capacity. And this is what I would call the new pedagogy for the 21st century is really a student led pedagogy that the teachers are equipping them with how to break down their learning task, how to organize their work, how to work against a standard in this case, a, a learning standard students of all backgrounds are capable of doing high rigor work. That's what our research has shown. It's also, of course, a cornerstone of our belief system in a democracy. 
you have to get rigor in order to get rigor. And this is where my research is. You have to build agency in order to kids to do rigor. They have to develop together. So as the students are more capable, because you've been working with them to take more responsibility, the teacher has to release that responsibility. One of the ones that we love to see re given to children, but rarely see it. It's 20 years or more in the research. It's called student led formative assessment. That's when the students know what the learning target is of the lesson. I think we all could agree that's paramount, but rarely done. We do this all the time. We walk into classrooms and ask kids, what are you learning today? And how do you know when you learned it? And they're like, I don't know, whatever teachers teach. Yeah. That's how I went to school. That's how you went to school. We didn't know. We just did what we were told. Right. To get a learning partnership, the student has to know what they're learning, has to be able to organize themselves and their peers to that learning outcome, and has to partner with the teacher as well as their peers to achieve it. That's a completely different pedagogy than what 90% of our teachers have been trained in. Yeah. It, it makes me think about the, the problem of assessment as well, where you're talking about formative assessment. Formative assessment is much preferable to high stakes summative assessments, which is lots of times the way our educational system is measured. People want harder numbers. They want more, more standardized metrics when in reality we're developing individuals. Do you have any thoughts about how the assessment needs to evolve? If it's better for the kids to be doing group work, frequently the way you measure individual contrib contributions to group projects is very different than if they all take a standardized test and you can compare one student to another. Yeah, you, you've uh, went through a lot of different things with some nuances. Let me break them down. So first of all, we're, group work is not the same as teamwork. Group work, which um, I experienced, I'm sure you experienced. I hated group work when I was in school, and particularly in college, because a few kids that cared about their grade did the work and everybody else just coasted on it. Yeah. That is not at all what I'm talking about. And, and the research term is social loafing. Mm -hmm. That's when kids are in a group and they can just hide and coast on the, the higher performers or the more motivated performers. What we're focused on are creating the protocols in place and so that all students contribute to their maximum effort. That's when you get learning acceleration. The other thing is that when I'm talking about classroom formative assessment, student led formative assessment, we're not talking about a test. We're talking about students checking their work as they're doing it against the standard or the learning target and being able to self correct so that they get to the learning target by the end of the day. This is very critical. If this is put into place with the abundant number of research uh, studies tells us a meta-analysis that includes all of those together, you'll get two years of learning growth in a year. Hmm. It just rarely happens because those are classroom systems. Again, most folks aren't, aren't well trained in. This yep. is why we see the augments of technology could be helpful, but not sending kids groups of questions, but rather letting them track their learning. Because again, if they're answering a question, it's a compliant learner. I don't know why I'm answering it. I'm just answering it. Right. If a student achieves the learning target every day. And assuming that learning target is aligned to the intent rigor of the standard, we remove something called the daily achievement gap. The daily achievement gap is just an achievement gap over time. Many teachers, when they're not doing these systems, and again, many of them haven't been trained to put them in place. Teachers are always working hard, but we have to give new skills. What happens is that the kids don't do well in the test and teacher goes, I don't understand this. I covered the content mm -hmm. and he or she did cover the content, but it doesn't mean it was learned. Mm -hmm. The only way to tell if it's learned is to give them a correct task and then check the work of the task or more powerfully, let the kids check the work of the task. Yeah. And these things should align up. I had the privilege of, uh, moderating the national assessment panel studying this issue and put out a report, which we put out free of charge through a research center called a comprehensive and balanced assessment system. And it shows how assessments happen in cycles, the formative assessment one, which is run by the classroom teachers by far the most important and also would include a weekly quiz and, and those type of things to tell whether kids are learning what was taught. Mm -hmm. 
the next cycle is a mid cycle. That might be a end of unit quiz or test or something like that. And then they're checking with, or what they're teaching and kids being taught, aligning with what the curriculum says should be taught. The next one would be a benchmark or even a state test. This is a long cycle. And that should tell if your curriculum's actually aligned correctly to the test. Mm -hmm. One of our issues happens to be that's very common now is purchased benchmark or interim assessments that are, they're, they're sold as being neutral, which is really a horrible idea. It means they're not aligned to your curriculum. I call it tracking the train wreck without any weight to prevent the train wreck. So what it does is it doesn't tell you how to improve your curriculum or teaching process. These has zero utility for that. It just tells you there's a problem. And so the way schools have tried to address it, they put kids in interventions right. and remediation. And here's what we know of the research on that. The longer students are in interventions, the worse they do. I mean, we get the exact unintended results for interventions to be successful. They must be intense and they must be short mm -hmm. and you have to return them to core instruction as quickly as we can. I call it intervention jail. They go in and they don't come back out. We yeah. see kids for years in interventions and what they just lose their motivation. They begin believing that they're not smart. And once they believe they're not smart and they lose their motivation, it's really hard to recover that. A very bad place that again, well-intended systems put kids and we have to stop and rethink what we're doing. We're in and have visited a number of schools where they have a majority of their students, over 50% are in interventions and they're not dealing with core instruction, which is the real issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one. Yeah. So we're talking about changing the system. <laughs> it sounds like you're able to do these at an individual uh, district level, most likely. And the success around the turnaround cases is, is great evidence that there is something here to this, the shift, but. A lot of our institutions take time to shift and the system itself, people have been talking about things being systemic and understanding ecosystems and systems thinking. How far ahead do we need to look or, or how soon do we have to act? How do we scale our actions so that we can pivot to a better place faster? Do you have any perspective on how we could accelerate some of that change? That's again, what we study out of our applied research center, where we have a systems based model. That's all we work in because just developing individuals though will work, it won't sustain. When I'm working with superintendents, I start with their portrait of a graduate. What do they want? And it's usually very good. Hmm. Then we look at the core instruction and say, do you see these things happen? I said, no. Okay. That's the gap we have to close. So the portrait of a graduate tends to be, we want independent critical thinkers. We want them to have 21st century or a new economy skills. Mm -hmm. We want them to have empathetic and compassionate. We want them to be principled at all really good things. Then you, you unpack that and go, okay, how are we developing this? And how are we seeing our graduates actually attaining this and seeing Dissidence is really important because we got to work on it. The long way to do that is to make that a very top-down approach and it probably won't work, frankly. You have to clarify your model of instruction, your vision for instruction, you know, which of the three tier one core instructions that I spoke about earlier and I, my, uh, last book on the power student teams, I detail those three in great detail. There's only one of them, and that's the team-based learning that truly gets to these portraits that, that they, they typically have. And then we back map, what are we going to do to get there? And we use John Cotter's, uh, change theory on this. So you do not move your whole system. You can't, the system will win. It will outlast the reformer. You have to get coalitions of the willing. Mm. And so. What research tells us is 15% or so of the population, just a general distribution will jump on this change and there are risk takers. And we find that all the time with teachers, they'll jump on this and principals as well. They want to do this, 
help them get success with it right away. Just over support those people. Mm -hmm. And then we use uh, a version of Elmore's rounds. Richard Elmore, who passed away recently from Harvard, uh, developed a really good rounds process where you bring invite teachers in that are, they're not really risk adverse. They just are like, I don't want to be first. Mm -hmm. Prove it works and secondly, prove you're going to stay with it. This mm -hmm. isn't going to be a flavor of the month and change later. And then they're like, okay, it works. I'll, I'll come along and try it. And then our experiences, once you get 40% of the teachers through this expanding of the coalition, they're willing to toward a broad based action, the whole school culture of the school changes. And once that happens, the rest of the teachers join. We've had no issue with teacher unions at all, as long as it's well communicated and we show the level of support teachers are getting through this, that they've always asked for, and we decouple it from the teacher evaluation system. Mm -hmm. Teachers have to have the safety to experiment until they get good. Yeah. And when they get good at this, they knock it out of the park on evaluation systems because it really shouldn't be about how your kids are going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's the process that we have to take people through. Makes sense. And then that's at a district by district level. Is there a broader movement that folks can connect into? Is there a community of interest or practitioners who are adopting some of this thinking? Because it does actually seem like the type of thing that you could connect and convene yeah. regularly with folks who see a different model emerging. Any thoughts on that? Yes. So. Building expertise is our national conference. It's really around people doing this and implementing it. It's very inexpensive conference. It's in Orlando in June. It can come to our website, learningsciences.com or buildingexpertise.com and see it. But it is a way to get that experience, learn about it and not spend very much money in order to do that. We do a lot of free resources. We have academicteaming.com. Everything there is free to let teachers start learning about it. And, and hopefully they would take the next step and secure professional development, professional coaching around it. We're working on a process to be able to certify teachers through that, because I think we have to really rethink what we think of as a master teacher in this country. Yep. Not in. The last chapter of the power student teams, as I was writing that book, it really came down to, we should define a master teacher as developing master students. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that's again, accomplishing this portrait of a graduate. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if we had a K-12 system that was intentional at developing agency and rigor of all their students through the processes that we're talking about? We will absolutely end generational poverty in this country if we equip students with that. I firmly believe, and I'm talking about generational, that doesn't mean that people won't make bad life choices and, right. and end up in poverty, but this idea that I have no way out and the school never closes my achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And we have trapped so many black and brown students into this that the only way out is the reforming tier one core instruction. We cannot buy a technology. We cannot wait for a state mandate. And the federal government's not going to rescue. Yeah. It, the, everything I'm talking about, a superintendent and the superintendent's cabinet and principals can do. Yeah. There's no regulation against it and there's no regulation for it. It is in the discretion of their job function. They get to design their core instruction. Yeah. I, but there is another uh, party to be considered in all of this, uh, which is one that we've been tracking over the last year or two in particular, and that's parents and the level to which parents, many of our listeners may not be K-12 educators or superintendents, but they at least likely had parents at a minimum, and they may even be parents. <laughs> and parents have been activated in, in many surprising ways over the last couple of years. Any thoughts around your message to parents or parent educators or some of the trends we've seen in the last few years around how folks are, are perhaps leaning in 
to their children? Yeah. And I think this is unfolding. So for us, we've enjoyed great parental support because once it's explained, they get it. They want their students to be advantaged for 21st century careers. And when they see agency developing in their students, they get really excited at how well-behaved and self-regulating students are their children at home. Mm -hmm. That's not something they expected. And we always see that spillover effect because once you change the learning culture and the school culture, it, it has positive impacts to home culture. I think that the pandemic has given parents a lens into the classroom, unlike anything we've ever seen before, some good and some not so good. And I think that we will see much stronger parental advocacy going on. And we also have for this anti critical race theory movement that I expect will grow politically over the next couple of years after we saw the results of the election in Virginia, mm -hmm. a purple state that actually flipped due to that single kind of issue. We're all about equity in our work. And we also, even though you didn't ask the question, I just think schools need to stay strong on equity and make sure they're focused on the right things. Everything I've talked about is about equitable outcomes, this entire podcast, but I didn't have to bring CRT in any of them. Mm -hmm. We have to live our values of equity. We have to bring those values into our core instruction. And I haven't found any pushback against that. And I think that we'll have to recalibrate on focusing on tier one core instruction for equitable outcomes. And everything I talked about provides equitable access and to rigor and learning outcomes by making the core instruction more accessible through team-based learning. Yeah. Well, it's funny as a parent of a three-year-old, there is a lot of team-based learning that happens in preschool and, and good preschool instructors, I think, establish that authority. Not like you really can rein in three-year-olds anyway, but, but it is interesting how in some ways uh, getting familiarized with this for the first time, it does feel like we kind of lose our way after early childhood and perhaps some of this team-based orientation. The other thing I really liked that you talked about earlier is the idea of being transparent around the learning objectives, including like metacognitive ones, learning how to learn and describing here's what you will hopefully reflect on coming out of this conversation. Those are all really uh, powerful, I think. And I think they resonate with folks in, in a lot of different ways, regardless of how old their kids might be. As we wrap up, if folks are, are interested again, Michael Toth and the company is Learning Sciences International, learningsciences.com. You can find out more there. But as we start to conclude, Michael, I always like to ask our guests what else is capturing their imagination these days. Sounds like you're plugged into a lot of different things. We also frequently ask uh, for what, what are your sources of inspiration? Any closing remarks, closing thoughts, anything that you think our listeners should be especially tuned into as they head back uh, to the rest of their lives? Yeah, I, I, I'll go back to my source of inspiration is getting out of the office, getting into classrooms and not having been able to do that during the height of the pandemic was, it was personally difficult as well as much more difficult for our schools. And I think my encouragement out there is I'm seeing more openness to do things differently and not go back to the old model. The pandemic put us in second order change anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing more and more educational leaders with the courage of saying, let's leverage that and change the way our teaching and learning process was. And that, that's my recommendation. We can't go back to the old, what we look at pre pandemic, which did get better results than the pandemic, didn't have all that great of results to begin with. And we still had tremendous racial achievement gaps, tremendous gaps between advantage and disadvantaged students. And again, the only way to close that is to do what we've been talking about, putting real skills into students on how to be better students, how to run thinking processes in their team. And as they do that, they absolutely close those achievement gaps between advantage and disadvantage and black and brown students and majority students. We've seen it time and time again. This is research proven. It's evidence-based, which means it's replicable in a variety of learning environments. And it's just good instruction. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying anything we haven't known in 30 years. We just haven't been able to do it. And we've unpacked the whys we haven't been able to do it. And it really is the fear of loss of control and realizing that you have to train students to be able to take ownership of their learning and become master students, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Lots to chew on. Uh, hopefully our listeners enjoyed the conversation, some interesting perspective, and hopefully some game-changing ideas that can change the conversation about K-12 education, particularly in the schools that, that need to turn around the most. Thank you, Michael Tots, for joining us on Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it very much. And for our listeners, if you like what you're hearing, write us a review, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.